And so, but then we realized this whole idea of like off-grid homesteading and growing your own food and being self-sufficient. And we were like, wow, that really sounds like the true rebellion against the system would be providing for yourself. Hey everybody, welcome back to another Nature's Always Right video. Today I have my friends, the Rambling Farmers, with me. They are a traveling couple that farms all over the United States, working at different farms, and they do it all living out of a off-grid tiny home on wheels. I'm actually in a school bus right now. So uh, in this episode, we're going to interview them all about their business that they've created, uh, being able to farm all over the country, and um, they really focus on regenerative no-till methods, and uh, it'll, I'm sure you'll find it really fascinating how they got into this and the work that they are doing. Our business basically formed out of a desire to mesh two very antithetical passions, which are travel and farming, which are quite opposite of each other. And um, really, you can trace it all the way back to like, what, I guess like seven years ago, eight years ago for you, six or so years ago for me when we were just like traveling hobos and um, Cheesy got picked up hitchhiking one time on the Oregon coast. Yeah, and they took me back to this beautiful homestead. They were on this hillside. They were living out of old broken down school buses, had chickens and dogs running around. Sheep were having babies or goats were having babies. And um, I just was like, wow, that's a dreamy lifestyle, you know, and that's they're just living off the land. And so when I met her, um, you know, maybe six months later, uh, I realized that we shared that same vision of wanting to be autonomous and to be able to grow our own food and, and be self-sustaining. And so that kind of started leading us down the path of farming um, in which we ended up moving to Oregon and she got her degree at OSU. At Oregon State. Yeah, we like we decided to settle down from the road um, because, well, for a variety of reasons, but. Mainly, we were on the road initially because we were just kind of like fed up with mainstream society. And we were young and we were rebellious and we were like, yeah. is this all there is to life? Just like work, buy, consume, die, do the regular path. We were some young punks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. And so, yeah, that led us to Oregon. And we kind of started our first homestead there while I was going to college. And yeah, and then everything just started coming together over the a few years. We got our first farm jobs in Montana because of course we couldn't stay in one place for very long. So we went to Montana and um, did a farm apprenticeship. And then we went back to Oregon, worked on a couple farms there. And we fell in love along the way with all our own like homesteading experiments of like home brewing beer and making our first compost yeah. and vermicompost, Hugel culture raised beds. Perennials. We wanted to know everything. Like once we started to dive in and find this whole ecological world, we wanted to get to know all parts of it. And so we were making our own compost. And I was really passionate about that. And that kind of took me down my road of, um, of my passion of soil microbiology. And so then, yeah, we got the farming bug. We started working on farms, realizing like, oh, we actually could make a living doing this. We, um, also a crossover from our hobo life was that we just get to be like dirty all the time. We don't have to be all like prim and proper going to an office. Yeah. And uh, we could just- Work outside. Yeah, we could just live outside basically. Mm -hmm. um, so that basically led us to wanting to hit the road again. And we dreamed up this bus and it took us over a year of craziness to convert the bus, um, which I'm sure we'll go into in a little bit, but that, that project um, really prepared us a lot for farming and through um, you know the trials and tribulations of figuring out how to do something we'd never done before with like off-grid solar electrical and carpentry and plumbing and all these things um, we learned the problem solving skills we need in agriculture. So what happened was is we converted our school bus and we took off in it once it was done we had a deadline 
we had finished that farm season up. We were already working on a farm while we were converting. And then we left and we went to Texas and we kind of realized we were like, well, we went back to another farm for, we ended up dedicating another full season to a farm, which isn't what we wanted to do. We wanted to be able to actually travel frequently throughout the year and also make a living from farming. We were discussing many ideas on how we can do this. We can sell products or, or how are we gonna do this? And we realized, you know, well, farming, that's our skill set, that's our expertise. So how can we do that? And that's when Logan branded us, you know, the Ramblin' Farmers. And um, we were doing all those other things, you know, making and selling products as well. But we wanted to really mesh farming into it because we knew that we could really make a living doing that. Yeah. And but so, we didn't have the business model down right off the bat. It definitely yeah. took trial and error. And also looking around, seeing that most people that live full time in vans and buses were some sort of freelancers, um, whether it be, you know, like freelance writers or YouTubers or whatever. Um, so we just kind of came up with the idea of freelance farm hands um, yeah. and worked to figure out how to market that to farmers because Based on our experience, we knew that most small-scale organic farms have these big bursts where they need a high tunnel put up, but their crew is too busy doing this. They have this huge winter squash harvest coming in, um, whatever. It's a really busy time, but or they do pregnancy, wanna, you know. Or, yeah, or they get pregnant or whatever it is, and they, they need experienced people to come in in this short window because they don't have the time and money to invest in like all new employees that they have to like retrain and everything. So that's how we came up with the idea of short term freelance farmhands. <laughs> so then comes the bus. Yeah. Now you had no experience building a, a bus home or any of this, right? So no. you just jumped in head first and went for it. So how did the, the bus come about and How'd you learn how to put a wood stove in and all the different <laughs> the solar and all these different things? It was really hard. So, so yeah, before building the bus, you know, I think combined our only, you know, carpentry experience was was me building a chicken coop and a potting bench, and you know, back in our old <laughs> homestead, you know. So that was literally the amount of carpentry experience that I had and had zero electrical experience, zero you know, plumbing experience, flooring experience. So luckily there was a lot of other people that have already done this and they've laid the framework out pretty easily for other people to begin. And then from there, it's just, you know, using your own creative mindset, learning the tools, you know, hopping on YouTube, looking at forums, what are people doing? And we took a lot of things from different buses and made them our own. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we just jumped headfirst into it. I was honestly pretty doubtful I was uh, the at my skills. Of the project. But Logan was really great at just taking something and breaking it down into smaller steps that we could accomplish. Yeah. And so it all started with just gutting the bus. And then once that we had that clean slate, then it was pretty easy to start building up from there, you know, starting with the floor and then the walls and the ceiling and, and doing all of that. So, uh, um, but keep in mind, we were farming full time, like 12 hour days all season. So we, it really did take a full year because it was just like every spare moment we were like, we really want to do this right. You know, we want to live in this thing for the next five years. And also the bus, um, is part of this like larger plan where eventually we do want to find land to settle down on and start our own farm. And we have always had the idea of starting kind of on virgin land or just like pasture. So, um, and after seeing many farmers, like starting a farm and building a house at the same time is really challenging. So we thought, you know, one day when we find land, we can just park this off grid bus and live in it. Um, yeah. while we start our farm and then focus on building our house down the road when we're less overwhelmed. <laughs> so how long have you lived in the bus so far? Over two years now, yeah. right? Yeah. I guess. We just hit our two year mark and uh, I think. December. In December, yeah. Um, so what's that been like? You said it was like 130 square feet. I think that our, our experience isn't like the most informative because before we had lived in so many vans together, like yeah. as a couple. Um, and they were way crappier vans that were not converted or anything like that. They were just like 
milk crates with a pallet and a mattress on top or yeah. whatever. And she mentioned, you know, us kind of living in like the hobo lifestyle for a while. So there was a stint, like, you know, before I met her, I wasn't traveling in any vehicle. I just had my backpack and I was sleeping outside on my tarp in my sleeping bag uh, with my dog and just kind of hitchhiking around. So. So it wasn't a huge transition, basically. Yeah. It was glamorous. Yeah. This, this yeah. is super luxury to us compared to what we were doing. You know, back then we didn't realize that these old junkyard vans that we were traveling in could be converted into something yeah, like this know. and that we could have all our needs. We didn't know that people were doing that or that that was, like, we didn't ever even conceive that idea, so. The one thing I say after this whole experience is that Every couple, if you really want to be with someone for a long time, I feel like you should have to do a huge project together, whether it's building your home, starting a farm, like whatever it is, because it's taught us more than anything about collaboration and um, kind of the division of the division of labor, basically. Like we each have our own thing that we're in charge of and that keeps the ship running smoothly so we can enjoy life and like not, I mean, we do argue, but not like, it's <laughs> not like, yeah, yeah. It's not like we hate living in this small space together. It's actually really easy once you get used to it. So once you built the bus and now, okay, let's go work on some farms. How did you go about finding who to work for? Yeah, finding clients, that's a, that's a so, good question. Ironically, the same way we met Steven, um, really through the No-Till Market Growers podcast was like, kind of our jumping off point just because, um, you know, we had worked full seasons on tillage farms before. That's where we got most of our experience before hitting the road in the bus. So we already knew we wanted to go more towards no-till. And it's not that we don't work on tillage farms, um, but yeah, no-till is definitely where our heart is and that's like our target client, basically. Yeah. Um, so I kind of copied the I kind of copied the, I don't know what you would call it, the protocol that um, a lot of freelance writers use because I'm a writer myself. And so we created this thing just basically called cold emailing. Um, so we're always searching for farms or hearing about farms. We're in the community. So anytime someone mentions like, oh, this small farm in Tennessee or this small farm in Florida, we look it up, we write it down. I keep a whole spreadsheet of yeah. like every farm we've ever heard of basically. Yeah. Um, and then we basically crafted a, a pitch that explains, you know, who we are, what we do, our rates. And I just started sending that out, shot in the dark. I was kind of scared at first. It was like, no one's going to take us seriously. No one's yeah. going to reply. And she also built this amazing website. I mean, she's yeah, just kind website. of a natural at building websites. She's been doing it since she was like six years old. <laughs> Not six, <laughs> but since I was Nine a kid. Years old. Something like that. She had her first business, you know, a doggy daycare business. Yeah. So she's a real natural uh, businesswoman. And so she kind of built our website and, and really crafted that whole thing that people can um, find their way to even through you know just googling you know farm jobs how to find a farm job and things like that people we get thousands of viewers you know every month and that that has helped tremendously so that people can you know when we are cold emailing they can go to our website and see that we are a legit business and we're not just like some hippies la 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 you know traveling in a bus that don't yeah. work hard or don't really you know, have a, a good work ethic and, and a legit business. And I think also building up the testimonials because, you know, the small farm community is, is small, especially small scale ecological no-till farming, <laughs> like that's a niche. Yeah. Um, and so shout out to Elizabeth of Singing Frogs. That was one of our major first clients where we were like, oh my God, pinch me. We get to work <laughs> at Singing Frogs. But they, they've been our return client multiple times. They're awesome people to work with. And we were able to, you know, fill in just some short gaps when we were passing through, help them out a lot. And um, they gave us just one of the nicest testimonials ever. And I think that just, yeah, having the, um, just kind of like that verification um, from prominent farm, or not even prominent farmers, it doesn't have to be a famous farm per se, but just any farmer that, you know, farmers trust farmers. So if you as a farmer want to hire someone, it's just gonna like increase the probability if you can hear not only from previous employers, but from, um, from other farms that they, that are legitimate, that they've actually worked for. So how much experience did you have before you kind of went all in on this? Um, farming business and 
you know, how much experience do you think someone else who wants to get into farming, what would they need to start trying to find a farm to work for? Before we started our business, I think we had about two seasons worth of farming experience. So um, really not a whole lot, uh, but we also had our home garden experience, our homesteading experience, and um, we had also worked underneath some uh, older horticulturalists um, on their property, on their homestead, that taught us a tremendous amount um, about gardening and farming and homesteading. One of our biggest things that we like to teach people when they ask us those sort of questions is like, you really don't need any experience to get into farming. Um, obviously, everyone starts with no experience. Uh, we got our first apprenticeship with zero experience, and it was a paid apprenticeship. And that's something I also like to teach people too, is that you should, farming, you don't have to work for free. Like there's plenty of paid farm jobs out there. Um, so as soon as we realized that, I mean, it's taken a while to realize our, our worth, but um, you, ba you don't really need experience as much as you need a good attitude, um, a physical robustness, um, especially if you can demonstrate um, a history of like athletics or hiking or anything like that. That's definitely farmers like to know that you can handle like working outside and doing physical things. Um, and then just a level of professionality. I think a lot of people forget that, you know, farming is a business and any farmer, um, at least on a production type farm, that's not like woofing or anything like that. They're looking for people that can be professional um, in the workplace. And so if, if you're able to portray all of those things, um, the level of experience isn't always going to matter. And that's why I've met a lot of people um, at prominent farms, like Singing Frogs, for example, where they got chosen over an applicant that had far more experience than them purely just because of like their passion, their professionality, their positive attitude. Because when you're out in the field all day for whatever, eight, 10, 12 hours beneath the hot sun in the pouring rain and the hail, whatever, you're working with a group of people depending how large the farm is. Like if you're a downer and you're a complainer, it doesn't matter how many years of experience you have, no one's gonna wanna work with you. Yeah, and another good thing to mention too is that you know, farming requires such a variety of tasks that the more than likely you've already worked in some kind of business that a farm could utilize those skills that you've learned in that business. So, I mean, even, even you know, customer service, you know, waiting tables, things like that, you might fit well in the farmer's market scene or, um, you know, yeah, if, if you've done welding or carpentry, I mean, farms need all those kinds of skills. Um, it's a variety and, of skill set. And also, like, when we first applied for our first farm jobs, he was working as a chef at a hospital, which doesn't seem like directly correlated, but really it is in terms of food safety, being able to hustle, um, you know, just being able to like do meticulous work in a fast way without cutting your finger off or whatever. The hustle. Yeah, and hustle then and, and then also, yeah, my experience in customer service and just portraying those, those crossover skills. And another thing that I like to tell people um, about finding a farm job with no experience, I think it is beneficial to start with like a larger scale organic farm, not like huge, but one of the first farms we worked on was a 60 acre organic farm. And um, just by sheer statistics, the amount of people they hire is gonna be more. And you have this opportunity to like, kind of become an expert in a certain area. So that's how we became expert harvesters, was working on a harvest crew. And yeah, so all of that put together really made me glad that we worked on a larger scale organic farm before we started targeting um, the smaller scale no-till farms, just because of that, that breadth of experience and the diversity of people you can interact with. So what is the future for Rambling Farmers? You guys have been telling me about a new project you have coming up that's really exciting. So we'll be returning to New Hampshire, New England, uh, come March, and we are going to be uh, managing the vegetable production on this nonprofit farm called Stonewall. And not only are we managing their vegetable production, but we're creating an entire incubator program to help grow new farmers, not new farmers, but farmers. We want to bridge the gap from managing a farm to owning a farm 
because a lot of times people who may have you know been a part of farm management haven't been able to manage the entire system and so this will give people a chance to kind of bridge that gap to where they can manage an entire system you know from marketing seeding you know whatever repairs that may need to happen on the farm. Crop planning systems, Crop all the planning. things. And in the process, we're kind of incubating ourselves in a way because we do have all this experience, um, but yeah, we've never run on an entire operation by ourselves. So one of our goals, we're calling it the stepping stone incubator because it is a stepping stone for people with um, three to four years of experience that are trying to move towards owning their own farm but aren't quite ready to um, to take the dive or they may not have the financial fortitude to take that dive and start their whole own business yet. So the incubator model is well known in agriculture um, and we're just creating our own version of that and at the same time building our own resume and we are able to, oh look there's the sun, <laughs> we are able to kind of help this nonprofit farm where their systems they didn't really have farm systems in place in terms of the market garden. And the, the place was just a little disheveled and, and unkempt. And they had a lot of turnover happening. And so we realized that this idea of an incubator would help with that turnover because we're establishing these systems and trying to design um, a plug and play kind of setup where um, anyone with enough experience can come in and run this, this incubator farm for one season, two seasons, and then move on and hopefully start their own farm or do something else. So they don't have to worry as much about the turnover because I think turnover is going to be really common in um, that sort of situation anyways on a nonprofit farm. So they can extend that education to more people while also um, maintaining like a solid brand and a solid level of quality and, and systems. And so doing that, you know, using the lean farm technique, you know, by Ben Hartman, it's a book that we reference quite a bit and it's kind of scaling things back and um, just uh, standardizing everything, you know, as far as bed links and thing like, things like that. And another part of this incubator program that we're doing that, you know, sets it aside from just, you know, someone applying for a managing position is that we're actually creating manuals, video manuals um, for the person to come in and watch and see how things are done here. Um, the systems that we have set up and how they work. So yeah, it's kind of, it's an experiment in a way because I don't know if any other incubators are following this sort of formula. Um, so we'll see what happens in the years to come. We'll definitely be returning to Stonewall to um, help, um, just help train and encourage future incubators there. And if anyone's interested in it, I'm sure soon we'll have more information out about how, um, how to follow along with the incubator's progress and eventually apply to be an incubator at Stonewall Farm next year. So it is just a one year project for us and then we will, we're not quite ready to settle down yet. So we'll <laughs> move on again um, in the bus and continue being the rambling farmers on the road. And we'll kind of have this legacy left behind. And um, the whole thing is kind of built around I wish I could credit someone with this quote. I'm not sure where I got it, but it's build the systems around the work that needs to be done rather than around the person. So um, that one really just resonated with me because farmers are, I mean, by nature are incredibly intelligent and adaptive people and they have just like a wealth of knowledge in their heads. And so one of our goals with this incubator is to kind of get that, um, the knowledge and the systems out of our heads and into a, a clear setup with clear manuals and how to's where anyone can come in and learn as they go. And we can, you know, host workshops and guide them along the way. Yeah. And hopefully those systems will be built around the work so that um, if people are rotating in and out of this program, it can help them as a stepping stone towards their future endeavors. Yeah, and what's really great about this farm too is that we actually have the ability to host workshops there and to uh, really get involved with the community. Um, the farm is open for anyone to come visit at any time. There's hiking trails there. 
Um, you know, there's a small dairy on the farm as well that you can go visit and um, an organic savory hub dairy. <laughs> yeah, and, and they host weddings there and events there and that we want to grow flowers for and things like that too. So there's a lot to do here and that's a big reason why we got in so involved with this farm was because it really does uh, match our ethos and our mission, which is to create, educate, and regenerate. And so with that being aligned with Stonewall's farm, it was just kind of natural uh, yeah. for us to come in here and to create this. And we're really, really excited about it. Um, yeah, so if anyone's in the Keene, New Hampshire area next year, 2021, or this year, I guess now, <laughs> you'll have to come visit us. The farm's wide open and yeah, we're really excited about it. Yeah, come say hi and come, come to one of our workshops. We're not sure exactly what we'll be holding or when we'll be holding them, but we do, we are planning some stuff for next year, so, or cool. for this year. And if people want to get in touch with you guys, either about the Stonewall or to follow along your blog, uh, where can they do that? Yeah, yeah so we recently um, left social media for the time being, but we are Ramblin' Farmers on there if we do decide to go back. But the main place is our website, ramblinfarmers.com, and it's Ramblin' without a G. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also have a blog, ramblinfarmers.com slash blog, and we post all kinds of information there for free for um, aspiring farmers, aspiring bus dwellers, uh, for people trying to learn how to get into farming with no experience, um, non-toxic, eco-living, all those sorts of things. 